Romans chapter 15. Since the beginning of the year, I've been in a series called the One Another series, looking at different places within specifically the New Testament where the gospel writers or where the Lord or where different people use the phrase one another. Beginning of the year, we talked about being members of one another as we looked at Romans 12. And last week, we looked at be like-minded towards one another as we looked at Romans 15. Today, I want to look at the command we're given right after Romans 15, the scripture we looked at last week in receive one another. Romans chapter 15, verse number seven, I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Therefore, receive one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I want to also read that verse in the New International Version. Accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Receive or accept one another. For those of you who were part of our study in Romans that concluded at the end of last year, you recall this command amongst others was part of Paul's instructions, especially within chapter 14, which we're going to look at today, when Paul was talking to the churches in Rome about, and the phrase he used, disputes over doubtful things. I found this story. A former police officer tells of the tactics of a group of thieves. He says, they enter the store as a group. One or two, specific, um, one or two separate themselves from the group. And the others start a loud commotion in another section of the store. This grabs the attention of the clerks and the customers. As all eyes are turned on the disturbance, their accomplices fill their pockets with merchandise and cash, leaving before anyone suspects. Hours, sometimes even days later, the victimized merchant realizes that things are missing and calls the police. But by then it's too late. I have to wonder if how often the devil has used this same strategy on the church. Seducing God's people with distractions. Meanwhile, the church is being ransacked of its power and of its witness, not by a loss of merchandise, but by a loss of mission. So to protect and guard against, us, against this, Paul instructs the church to receive or accept one another. But what does it mean to truly receive or accept? In the original language, the connotation was to bring in or to welcome one another. It literally is the opposite of something we understand very well, and that's to reject one another. Yet in the body of Christ, from my observation, we seem rather skilled at rejecting one another over practices, uh, whether how we gather, when we gather, how things should look, over which practices are sacred and which ones are not sacred, over how we interact with our culture, whether it be politics or something else. We've come to the place in the church where we believe that we have the right to determine how someone should be labeled or classified. And based on that, whether we accept them as part of the body or not. And these conflicts are real. How can we bridge them? How can we get past them and move to the place where we are commanded by Scripture to accept or receive one another? Well, the verse that we read begins with the, the word, therefore. Therefore. And this means Paul had just finished an entire list of explanations and going over a, a number of issues. And then when he got to the end of that list, he says, therefore, and gives this command. So let's take a look at what the therefore is there for. 
Go back with me to Romans chapter 14. You see, last week we received God's instructions for dealing with personal hurts or offenses that arise within the body of Christ. How many know sometimes we offend one another? You don't have to say amen. I know it's true. (laughs) But those were personal hurts that we were dealing with last week in talking about being like-minded. Today, we're not looking at personal hurts or offenses, but those disagreements that come up within the body of Christ about the various ways we go about being the body of Christ. See, churches in Rome weren't much different than the churches today. They really were not divided when it came to issues of faith or doctrine. They were being divided by practices. And basically, no matter how they felt about them, non-essential issues. They argued about whether or not it was okay for a Christian to be eating meat that had been offered to idols or to other gods. They argued about whether or not particular days were for gathering for worship were more important than any other day and should be seen that way. And they argued about the types of diets people could have. And it ended up in conflict, but it also ended up in rejection. And God's solution to all of this conflict was to stop condemning one another and to receive or accept one another. And at the end of Romans 15, verse 7, in order to bring praise to God. Now, in chapter 14, Paul offers seven steps in dealing with these situations. And the step that is step one is to hold back judgment. Romans chapter 14, verse 1 says, receive one who is weak in the faith but not to dispute over doubtful things. Up front, this leads to the question, what are doubtful things? Well, there are things that the Bible doesn't clearly address. Things that Christians of good conscience can disagree on. Now, we're not talking about things where the Bible is crystal clear. And there are things where the Bible is crystal clear. Or that on something that would violate a clear principle of the word of God. We're not talking about things like adultery, because when it comes to adultery, the Bible is crystal clear. There's no discussion. It's always wrong. It's always sin. The Bible clearly condemns it. It is not being judgmental to condemn that. It is not being judgmental to exhort someone, you shouldn't do that. Same thing with drunkenness. No discussion. It is always wrong. It is always sin. The Bible is clear and clear repeatedly about that. So we're not being judgmental or exhort- when we exhort someone, you know what, don't do that. Actually, in my perspective, we're showing love and care. We're trying to rescue them from what the Bible clearly stands against. But what about those doubtful things? Well, in Paul's day in Rome, there were mainly diets and special days that he dealt with in Romans 14. Mainly because they were both Jews and Gentiles, and many of the Jewish believers did not want to eat any meat that had been offered at any point in the process before it got to them that had been offered to idols. That's why many of them were vegetarians. And some believe that certain days, the Sabbath day, or certain feast days, or certain high holy days, were more important and more special than others. And there were some, when the meat gets to my table, I'm going to eat it. And there were some, doesn't matter what day it was, they're all alike. Some would not touch the meat offered to idols, and some would. What happened before it got to me was not my concern. So who was wrong? Well, according to what Paul is saying in this chapter, nobody was. Neither is absolutely critical to your Christian faith. If you want to worship God on Sunday, you need to. If you want to worship God on Monday, please worship God on Monday. If you want to, when you worship God on Monday, if you want to eat a ham sandwich, go for it. Styles of worship. You see, today we're not talking about meat or special days. So what are the things that we deal with? Well, styles of worship. 
Many churches divide over that. I've been in churches where it's really not worship if you haven't sung out of a hymnal. And I remember back when the words being projected on a screen or through a how we do it were just being introduced. And I still remember the criticism. I'd rather sing off from a hymnal than sing off the wall. And that's exactly how it was being portrayed. There is division among Bible versions, whether the New King James Version or the Old King James Version. We do know that the King James Version of the Bible didn't come into existence until the 1600s. That Jesus did not read from the King James Version of the Bible. If I've just blown your mind, I am really sorry. But this has divided some churches. I'm not going to that church. They read out of that new international version. Oh, please. What's divided the church at times has been not the issue of drunkenness, but general alcohol consumption. And years ago, and I've been in the church for a number of years, I remember back when I first came to the Lord in my teenage years, one of the big issues was the use of makeup the length or style of someone's hair, playing cards, going to movies. The list went on of what defined whether or not you truly were holy or not. But these were a host of things that the scripture, I'm sorry to blow anyone's mind, does not specifically speak to. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, thou shalt not cinema. (laughs) I've been looking for it. It's not there. It's not in there. And it took some uh, while to catch what I just said there. But in these areas, God is doing something that we seem reluctant to do with one another. He's leaving it up to you to make an informed decision. Gee, it almost seems like God trusts you and me more than we trust one another. The Roman believers were free to choose that the Sabbath was a special day different from all other days. And they were also free to choose that they were all alike. And even though people disagreed on that point, it wasn't an excuse, nor was it justification for rejecting one another. Likewise, if your conscience stopped you from eating meat offered to idols, then please don't eat it. Follow your conscience. But others were free to choose to eat the same meat if their conscience had no issue with it. What they weren't free to do, based on the disagreement, was judge one another or reject one another. So step one for Paul was hold back this judgment. Step two As you're holding back judgment, avoid looking down on those who don't share your convictions. Romans chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. You see, the tendency is not just to have our strong convictions. The tendency is to then have them and then look at people differently who don't have them. And then we wind up rejecting them and looking down on them and thinking less of them. And let's face it, as as human beings, when we look down on someone, for the most part, we have a real hard time not communicating that. Well, I'm only going to gather with people who look like me and think like me and talk like me and look at certain issues the same way I do. And I'm going to warn those around me about those so-called Christians. Talk about them in the public square. And yes, I'm talking about social media. Notice that either side is condemned judging here. Why? Romans 14 verse 4. Who are you to judge another, another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. I am quite comfortable with God being God. 
he's always going to be better at it than me. Paul is saying, hey, don't judge your brother. Don't judge your sister because they don't belong to you. They're not your servant. They don't answer to you. They will have to answer to God one day. Encourage them, yes. Exhort them, sure. Reject, never. And realize that so, in so many of these situations, God has accepted both of us, both of you. I've been here a year and a half now. And I have yet to stand into this pulpit with that instrument of total bondage, a tie. I have yet to wear one in this pulpit. I'm not sure if I ever will. I have a whole collection of ties at home. And for special occasions, I do wear them. When I've gone to officiate at a funeral, I wear a tie. If we ever go back into Manhattan and I have to go to work, it's part of the dress code, I will wear a tie. And in those situations, different perceptions and different perspectives are being put forth. What is most important to me is that when you come to the house of God, I want everyone to know that you are welcome just the way you are. That you don't have to get a certain wardrobe or go buy certain clothing before you can come hear the word of God, come have God minister to your soul, and you can worship with God's people. But there were those who would say, well, if you don't have a tie on, you don't have your anointing. I got news for you. If your anointing is in a tie, you're in trouble. And I am quite convinced that all my brother and sister, fellow preachers who insist on certain clothing, that God has accepted them, so I will accept them. And hopefully they will accept me. Because who am I to judge somebody else's servant? So we need to avoid looking down on one another just because it looks and sounds a little different than what we're used to. You. Step three, realize that each of us must live for Christ first and foremost. Romans chapter 14, verse number five, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord and he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to, the, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, for this is the end of Christ died and rose again, that he might be the Lord of both the living and the dead. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, what is being said here? Ultimately, we are commanded to live for the Lord. And that's going to look different for different people. Some people can do things, and for them, they're walking in the Lord's liberty. And some people can't do things as a protection because of the past they've come from and the different things that God has delivered them from, and they're protecting their heart and mind. Yet both are embracing the same principle of living for the Lord and walking the best way they know how. That whatever I do, I want to bring glory and honor to his name. That whatever I don't do, it's because I want to bring glory and honor to his name. The key here is personal honesty. See, you need to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and look to God and say that I honestly have no issue here and that you are truly trying to please the Lord. Because the bottom line, we will all stand before God one day. And that should be our focus. Until, end, un, un, until then, people of God, we need to accept one another. 
We need to not reject one another. It is Satan's biggest distraction. Step four, in Paul now trying to create this balance for the churches in Rome, make sure we don't put an obstacle in someone's way. Verse number 13 of chapter 14. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause, a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ, for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and not drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. We need to recognize that in many of these areas, some are a question of where we each are in our journey with the Lord. And how many know we're all different places? Some are just in different places and farther along. Some are stronger in their faith and can exercise greater victory or greater liberty. Some are strong in their faith but have received victory in areas that they want to continue to guard against. Perhaps some of those who do not eat meat to idols, it's because they were once part of an elaborate idol worship system and they want to put that far behind them. But being stronger in one area, having freedom in any area, doesn't give anyone the right to flaunt or push that freedom in someone else's face. Some of our brothers and sisters need those protections from temptation that others may not. Bottom line is I never want to be responsible for or contribute to in any way Someone heading down a path of sin. One of the biggest issues the church deals with is alcohol. I myself do not drink at all. I wish I could stand here today because it would make for better preaching and tell you it's for faith reasons. It's not. When I was 19 years old, a very young Christian, I got the great idea that it was time for me at the age of 19 to get drunk. I decided at 19, you know what, I'm going to do the adult thing and I'm going to get drunk. Even though I was a Christian, I was young, I was foolish. And so on New Year's Eve, I went out and I got drunk. Big time. Don't remember a thing. And that's not because it was 40 years ago. I, don't, I didn't remember a thing days later. What I do remember is New Year's Day. Pain beyond all imagination. And not only the pain of the hangover, but the, and I'm going to label it wisdom because otherwise I'd have to get really angry, the wisdom of my dear loving father who thought me laying on the couch in pain was one of the most comical things he had ever seen. So he went with all of his energy and turned the TV on as loud as he possibly could, which was playing the Rose Bowl um, or, or different parades. He went and got pans from the kitchen and was banging on them. Church, I haven't had a drop since. Because <laughs> when I look at something alcoholic, I can hear my father banging on pots. Now, it would be a much better Christian story to be able to tell you I'm standing here without going near alcohol because of faith or conviction or the Holy Ghost came down and spoke to me, it's because of my dear old dad. <laughs> That's just the truth. God bless him. It's, I remember it still so much. You see, we need wisdom here and what we need is a willingness individually in all of our lives, to be willing to elevate the needs of my brother or sister above my rights, above 
I have the right to do this, but what will it do to those around me? That's a Christian witness. Because we're supposed to be in this together. Something may not be inherently sinful, but if it is sinful for you, you shouldn't do it. And I should not be in a place where I'm causing confusion in your life. I should be able to help there. That's what verse 15 says about walking in love. I love you and your walk a whole lot more than I love my freedom and my rights. The kingdom of God is not about these matters, verse 17 said. It is not about food or drink. It is not about movies or hair length. It is about so many more weightier matters. And the kingdom of God is higher, much higher than our personal freedoms. Now, I also do tend to shy away from alcohol consumption especially in our culture, because our culture has demonstrated zero ability at self-control. Zero. And for too many people, it just tends to go down a wrong path. But we need to walk in love. Exercising care and walking in love, in verse 18 says, to God, that's acceptable. You see, no one, no one, Christian or non-Christian, no one likes to be forced to do anything. No one likes to be forced. You can't do anything. See, the better way, God's way, is to voluntarily refrain from something to help and edify my brother or sister. Step five that Paul outlines. Do only what leads to peace and edification. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Therefore... Let us pursue the things which make the peace, which, which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles and is offended or is made weak. You see, even good things that we are free to walk in, when we do them in a way that causes our brothers and sisters to stumble, become not good all of a sudden. We need to do things that lead to peace. Can't our nation use some more peace? So let's start even smaller than that. Couldn't the church use some more peace? And when I talk about peace, this is not just about quiet. How many know peace and quiet are very different? You can be in a room that's very quiet, and there's no peace. You can feel it. But we need to do things that lead to real peace. Things that lead to, it says, Paul says, edification. Things that truly build one another up. And then wind up building me up as well. There are so many things in our culture that people can get their nose out of joint about. Or just stomp off in some big huff. Or make some big scene that simply aren't issues of sin. If my freedom in Christ in a gray area is confusing or causing my brother or sister trouble in their walk, it is simply not worth doing. Now, there's balance here. We need to be careful. Because as I mentioned last week, we live in a culture where people get upset when you breathe. And if they're upset that you're breathing, my committed recommendation is please keep breathing. Please. But people get offended at anything, at the way the smallest thing is today. But what's interesting to me is the way we define words today differently than we did years ago. In the English dictionary that we would use today, the word offend means to cause anger or to resentment or to hurt. But in the Greek, where Paul is using a Greek word to be offensive, it means to entrap or to trip up or to cause to sin. Very different things. I can be breathing and make somebody angry. I can walk a certain way. I can drive my car a certain way and someone becomes angry. That's not the offense Paul is talking about here. 
If I'm doing or causing my brother something that causes them to truly sin, I should do what I can voluntarily with the uh, power and the freedom Jesus gives me to refrain from it. If something I do makes someone upset, well, as I've said, there are people who get upset when we breathe. That's not the same thing. But I want to do things that lead to peace and edification. Step number six is never parade your personal convictions. Romans chapter 14, verse 22. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Just as a personal feeling of liberty to do things, we have this. Those with convictions to not do things should not be parading it around as if they're somehow better than anybody else. Now, why would Paul tell us to keep our personal convictions to ourselves? Because that's what they are. They're personal. And human beings can't help when we parade things around to have pride rise up within us. And in many cases, God had to speak to you about something. And if it was meant for everybody, it would be in the book. But it's not. Although that would have been interesting for the first century church to have been given a commandment, thou shalt not cinema. They would have had no clue what that meant. Some things God does just give for you. But how can someone condemn themselves by what they approve or allow? And the answer is pride. We tell others to boost ourselves. Well, you might go to movies. I don't because I love Jesus. The implication there is that if you do go to movies, you don't. So that's an issue of pride. Well, I don't go there because I'm more mature in the Lord. Well, when you walk Or we say, when you've walked with Jesus as long as I have, you'll think differently. Whenever I hear those phrases, I just want to stand up and say, church, stop it. We need to be careful not to equate personal convictions with holiness. Now, later this year, I am going to do a series on holiness. Because one, the church needs to talk about holiness. And we don't talk about it enough. But I want to talk about what true holiness is and what it isn't. And genuine holiness always begins with humility. It's not arrogant. It's not boastful. It's not in someone's face. Genuine holiness begins with humility. But that's for in a couple of months from now. And the last step that Paul outlined. He said, bear with one another. Romans 15, verse number one. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edifications. That word for scruples in Greek literally means weaknesses. The sign of your strength, the sign of my strength in the Lord is not how much we reject others because of how weak they are and we don't become tainted. It is how we're able to bear with them, to invite them in, what we're able to put up with, essentially. Being a blessing to someone else should be our aim. Now, we really do spend so much time trying to change one another. How many knows we don't have that power to change anybody? But we serve the one who does. I'm quite content, like I said before, to let God be God in my life and let God be God in your life. Jesus did not come to this earth for his benefit. It was for your benefit and mine. Jesus did not suffer for his benefit. It was for your benefit and mine. Jesus did not endure betrayal for his benefit. It was for your benefit and mine. He did this for our benefit. And what we're being told 
by Paul in these scriptures is how can we do anything less? Think of the gulf that Jesus had to cross to connect with you and me. A massive chasm, this massive gorge to be able to come past all of our sin, all of our iniquity, all of our shortcomings, and connect with us by offering us a sacrifice. It just seems to me that the gulf he had to cross was always a whole lot bigger than the ones we have to cross to get to one another. And yet we're told to accept one another just as Christ accepted us. And he had to travel a whole lot farther. Church, when love prevails amongst believers, especially in times of disagreement, that love, that unity is a sign to the world that we are followers of Jesus. It's also a witness to them that God's got a better way. And how many know the, the, that the world we live in today, that the nation we live in today needs a better way? The way it's traveling is not a better way. So my prayer today is that the Lord would help his people stop being so distracted by the disturbance that the enemy is causing in the other part of the store, diving into controversy, mainly that grip our world. And our focus, how much does Jesus love you? How much does he love me? The love of Jesus, the glory of his kingdom, the unity of his people. I want to end where I began with Romans chapter 15, verse number 7. Therefore, receive one another, accept one another, just as Christ also received or accepted us to the glory of God. Stand with me, please.